Um, good morning. Uh, welcome back. This is a review lecture for the midterm coming up on um, Thursday, as you all know, I'm sure. Um, let's see, practical things uh, are that I will post the solutions to program assignment two after all the sections today. Uh, so you, have it, uh, you can look through and just maybe you'll learn something from my solution. It's not that it's that fancy. If you did it well yourself, you should be all set. But maybe you got stuck on something you could, you could learn from that. Uh, I did not, this is not included. I did not cover it last Thursday and it will not be included. But this we covered very well and it is part of the, uh, on the exam. Uh, just logistically, this room is not quite big enough for all of us. So watch out for an announcement uh, later today about that some of you are going to have to take the exam in a different room that I have requested over in Corey Hall. So based on your last name, you're going to figure out whether you come here or there. And uh, it's going to be pretty clear. So we're going to spread out the GSIs. Uh, one is going to be there. Uh, another GSI is going to help the DSP students who have all contacted me. And then uh, we will be a few people here. Yeah, they give two small rooms, apparently. This room has only 195 seats. And there are, including concurrent enrollment and everything, there's, we are like 210 or 15. Anyway, that's just the logistical part. Apart from that, try to be here early, like 9.30, like not this late. 9.30 so we can get seated, uh, no matter where you, if you take it here or in the other room, get seated early, fill out the front page, and you get exactly your 80 minutes that you need uh, for the exam. And uh, that's it. No calculators, no, uh, no notes, no books, right? But uh, pens and pencils. Any practical questions? about the exam? Yeah? What? I do not know. Um, I have a bunch of problems, but I'm not put together, so I don't know. Likely similar to, if you look at the old exams, I mean, mine is probably the most similar, but even if you look at the one by Mingu, uh, we all, they are about the same structure, right? Uh, many of those were 50 minutes, I think. So maybe I'll do, uh, although my last one was very, it was also 80 minutes. So the length, you can see approximately from that. You know, a bunch of problems, sometimes A, B, A, B, C. It's going to be the plan. I never finalize it until last minute, if nothing, partly because it's nice to procrastinate, but one, another thing is that I have office hours uh, after now, of course, but then also uh, tomorrow afternoon office hours. So I bet a lot of you are going to come and ask questions. So I'll probably not finalize the exam until after that, so I don't give, any, give anything away to you guys. It's hard to, to be a poker face when you ask questions and I know exactly what's on the exam. Uh, more practical questions? So um, obviously the review here won't be in any way complete. I just randomly, I thought I'll just bring up the slides and go through and say some comments. And I picked like one problem from each, uh, not section, but each chapter. And we'll see if we have time to do that. It's, um, I guess the best thing is to, if, to create a dialogue. It's not like these things that I picked happen to be important. I just found problems in the book that we haven't done that looked uh, interesting and maybe that I thought some of you struggled with. So uh, that's my plan for today. It's obviously a lot of topics, um, but... Uh, uh, at least maybe we can capture some of it. Let's see, uh, on, on chapter one, let me just get started and go through it all. Or maybe actually just to create some consistency here, I wanted to say one more thing about where we ended last time. Namely that we went to, um, yeah, let me start by that. So we, we remember Gaussian integration or any, any of them actually. Uh, you can do this little trick of moving any integral from A to B to minus one, one. And it looks messy, and we went through it quite in detail, and I think you can all manage it because you've done it on your homework. So you should be good with it. Uh, this was in particular true for Gaussian because those rules are given for minus one to one. Why was this not a problem for trapezoid and, and Simpson? Because they were formulated from A to B originally, right? And that's just, uh, I don't know, it's just a convention. I guess because the Gaussian rules look a little messy between A and B, they are so clean between minus one and one. Remember plus minus one over square root of three. But it's really the same thing. You can move any integral from minus 1, 1 to, to a, b. But the other big thing was this idea about the double integral. We did some examples. Um, uh, it, the pattern looks a little messy when it looks at like composite Simpson. And, and I'm sure it can be confusing, especially since I messed it up a little bit on my example too. But
But the idea with the double integral is really identical to calculus, first x, then y, or the other way around. Namely, you consider, for example, one of these x lines. If you look at these numbers here, it's a regular composite Simpson with an appropriate h, of course, which may or may not be the same as the k that you go in the y direction. Okay? And then you split this y line, for example, uh, using a composite Simpson in that direction. Now, what that means, of course, is that all these directions here are going to be approximated by the Simpson in the x, and all these are going to be by composite Simpson in the y. And when you multiply them together, you'll see quite easily we did, at least for the trapezoidal rule, we did it by hand, just multiplying all the terms. But you can convince yourself that if you keep one of the integral, let's say y, outside, and you do a composite Simpson along each of these lines, you get 1, 4, 2, 4, 1 on each of these, right? Then you take each of those and do in the other direction. That means that you multiply all those coefficients by 1, 4, 1, which means, for example, that, of course, you get 4 times 4 here, 2 times 4 here, etc., right? But uh, when you're going through it once, doing it is actually quite easy. You just set up this diagram, keep track of your h's and k's, and add everything up, and you get an approximation to the integral. Um, so that, that's, that's kind of the plan. I mentioned this can be done for Gaussian integration. I never showed an example. Let me do that quickly. Uh, so for multi, it's, it's identical. But I guess it's just another example. My multidimensional Gaussian quadrature. So the idea here is that you have a rule from minus 1 to 1 of x that can be approximated by a sum of, we call them coefficients ci and points xi. Okay? So this is how we write the Gaussian integration rules, uh, although I want to again say that they're all kind of written the same way. It's a question of choosing points and weights. That's how all our quadrature rules have been written. Uh, but the idea now is that you want to be able to write a double integral, let's say from minus 1 to 1, just like minus 1 to 1 is convenient um, for, the, for the 1D integration, of course the square between minus 1 and 1 in both x and y is more convenient because you don't have to move it. But you can apply the trick of moving things, you can apply this trick of course to move the square, turn it into a rectangle or do whatever you want. Anyway, we want to be able to integrate things of the form f of x comma y dx dy. And the idea here is of course identical to before, let's do approximate here, that you're going to do this in each direction. And it's going to be an outer product. So you're going to get two sums, one looping over x and one looping over the y. So we call those indices i and j. And then you get the product of these coefficients, and you get a bunch of points xi, and let's call these other points yj. Okay? So this is just what we did for the composite Simpson, namely that uh, First, let's pretend that you keep the outer integral. You only, pre you only, let's pretend that you start by looking at just this part here, right? It's really exactly what we've done before, except that there's a comma y there. And you remember from calculus, the way you do it is that you just ignore that y for now, okay? So take this big chunk here and replace by that rule, and you get sum of, I guess, i, ci, f of xi, right? And you get this big sum, so you get n terms in here. But each of those n terms should be then integrated in y, which you just do with the same rule, pretending that the xi's don't exist, right? And that, of course, creates another sum over, in this case, j. Each of these coefficients are multiplied by the corresponding cj's, and then you replace the point by yj. Okay? And an example would be, uh, of course, using the simplest possible rule, just to keep it simple here. And there are not even any weights, so it's almost not describing how to multiply them, but let's do it anyway. So this is a rule we like. It's the Gaussian quadrature rule corresponding to n equals two points, uh, and it has those two magic points x1 and x2 uh, that we derived in many ways, and it has two weights as well, and they're equal to one. And uh, so let's see, how do we draw this? I would say that we draw a figure like this. Here's y and here's x. Here's our square, and it goes from minus one to one, minus one to one. OK? And there's a function there, of course. Now, it's actually kind of nice to draw these points, x, i, and y, j. And for square, it's actually very easy, because the x, i's are exactly these points, and the y, j's are exactly those points as well. But what does that mean in this diagram? Should I put a point there? 
will there ever be a point on x i equals minus? No, because there is no y i equals 0, right? So the points are going to end up there. You see what that's going to happen? So x i and, and x, x 1 and x 2 are plus minus uh, you know, this number, 1 over square root of 3. And the y's are the same. And you're going to get all combinations of those two, those four, uh, those two coordinates in each, right? So these are the points. Um, all ending up at 1 over square root of 3. Anyway, so this, the end result is, of course, that we get this double integral of f dx dy approximated by, well, let's just do this. It's going to be a double sum, so there are going to be four terms, right? And the terms are going to be exactly f of minus 1 over square root of 3 comma minus 1 over square root of 3 plus something times f of minus square root of 1 over 3 plus 1 over uh, square root of 3, et cetera, right? But what about the weights? Well, these c's were 1. You've got to multiply them. That's why I meant that this is a little bad example, because you won't see the multiplication, because they're all going to be 1. So this ends up being f of minus this number, minus that number, plus, minus, and plus, plus, and minus, and finally, plus and plus. And that's it. So by evaluating f at these four magic points, you can uh, estimate that whole integral. And uh, you know, this is just, uh, you, you should see how this is analog. Why are there no four? You, you don't see the pattern of, you might wonder why I'm not doing this big scheme of fours and sixteenths and everything here. I am doing it. It's just that I chose such a simple rule that you don't see it. But this here, the weights here are really 1 and 1, and the weights here are 1 and 1. And I really do multiply them just like that to get 1, 1, 1, 1. So you can imagine having a 5-point Gaussian rule here and there. You get all types of weird products in between. And those numbers are not nice, because those weights are a little bit more crazy. So Simpson is kind of nice that you get all these nice multiples of 4 and 2, right? And 1s. But apart from that, I didn't do anything different with it. Uh, all right, so if I want to make this more messy and difficult, I would, of course, start moving the minus 1 ones uh, around, uh, which is, uh, in principle, not difficult. It's just uh, opportunity for mistakes. Um, of course, the big killer is to make non-rectangular regions. And you did have this in your homework as well, so you've seen how it, how it works out. And uh, it ends up being even, even easy cases like this. So the, the hardest thing I can do here are typically those triangles that you did in your homework. But of course, in principle, we could do anything that we did in calculus. Remember mappings for computing areas under circles and stuff like that. You, you, could, you could set these c axes and d axes to a lot of different things and compute quite complicated things. Um, yeah. Uh, between minus 1 and 1. Oh, oh so, so Gaussian wouldn't, wouldn't make any difference here. Uh, I agree that there is no k of x there. But you need to do the mapping. So uh, good point. How do you do that for Gaussian? Uh, so let's say you want to do a region. The general case is that you go, we want to go from A to B. And then here you have a top and a bottom, right? That, that's, the, that's the setting. And I think they are called C of x and D of x, right? OK, so, so the way to think about this is that at first you integrate for each of them in the, in the y direction. So the way it's written there is that the dy is the innermost, right? And you've got to go through all your, uh, for, for all your points, you've got to figure out. So those, those four points would end up, of course, in the x direction, they would end up here. But in the y direction, they would depend on the mapping. And in particular, we would do a straight line from there right up there and spread them out. You would have one point there and one point there. Here, they would end up something like that, OK? But the location of those points are quite obvious. It's really just plugging into this expression. Um, uh, so the K, there is no kx expression like that. But the interval from y minus 1 to 1 is really just mapped to each of these lines. So it can be, it can be obtained from that. But it gets a little messy. That's the reason we didn't assign any homeworks on it. I, I just want you guys to see that in principle it can be done. Simpson is easier because it really just, it, it, it's, it's not that easy, but it does correspond to one new step size k. But, but, but it's a little difficult because these steps are different all the time. But, but in practice, people don't mind doing this with Gaussian quadrature. 
You just have to put the points at, at the appropriate places. Same thing with the weights, that this, strength, this stretching here and this stretching here are different. So you get this skewness factor in the weights. But um, yeah, it gets a little messy. It's done on a computer easiest. I don't think there were any examples on that in the book, were there? Were there? Or, of course, no. But, but uh, at least a rectangle with Gaussian is trivial. Not trivial, but you should see that that's not too difficult. Take this guy here, what I just did. Let's take, well, any of them, right? Uh, how would you modify this if I, for example, want to go from minus 2 to, my, to plus 2 in the x direction? OK? So remember, uh, changing, uh, it, when, when you looked at this expression for stretching intervals, we could see basically that translation means that you move, move the points. OK? Stretching means that you move the points and you get a bigger or smaller, you get a scaling factor for the integral, right? So whatever way you have to convince yourself, if you want to go from minus 2 to 2 here, all these x points are also going to be multiplied by 2. And the entire x integral, which means the entire integral, is also multiplied by 2. So in words, if you replace these ones, no, the inner ones, the x by, by 2s, I can immediately just write a big 2 in front of everything and replace all these by 2s, right? And I would be done. And if, if you're confused by that, it's really just that mapping, but only applied to x. What if I stretch everything to minus 2, 2 in y as well? Well, that's easy. Then I multiply everything by 2 times 2, right? And all these numbers become twice as large. And finally, what if I want to shift it three steps to the right in the x direction? You don't multiply the integral by anything, and you add 3 to all the x coordinates. So that's how easy it is to do in practice. But all I'm saying, that, that, that I tried to say this last time, that this expression looks complicated with all this mapping. But it's really that simple. You got to move the points uh, so that they are mapped. Instead of from minus 1 to 1, they are mapped from A to B. And of course, that corresponds to this expression here, the midpoint and, and whatever it ends up being. Uh, if you stretch it, you also get a scaling factor. And that's, of course, exactly B minus, the new width B minus A divided by the old width 2. So stretching rectangles, I think, should be straightforward. All right? And then stop there. We didn't include this. We'll get back to that later. Um, all right, let's just go through here and whatever topics come up, ask questions, and we'll see what happens. All this math uh, does show up. So, you know, you want to review it. it was, I said already back then that it was all review. Uh, but it's nothing new, really. Um, you see, we used many of these things. Now you know. Back then, you didn't know why we were even talking about these theorems. In particular, things like this, the generalized, um, the weighted mean value theorem you might have not have seen before. You saw later when we did the integrals and we tried to show some error bound that that's why we needed it. Uh, Rolle's theorem we also needed already in, this ch in chapter 2 uh, on the generalized Rolle's. Uh, Taylor is the big thing that we do a lot of. And it's going to be even more after in, in, the, in the rest of the course when we come to the differential equations. Uh, please don't mix up Taylor. But for now, let me just say that from a practical problem solving perspective, the reason it's important is that it's kind of identical to the typical problem in chapter 3. Namely, the typical problem in chapter 3 is saying you're interpolating a function by a Lagrange polynomial through these points. Estimate the error, right? And, and then there is an error term. And Taylor is identical. It's just saying approximate this function by fitting a polynomial to one point only and a lot of derivatives. And remember, this was generalized osculating polynomial. But Taylor and Lagrange, it's all interpolation. If, if you really stretch the meaning of interpolation, Taylor is nothing but interpolation at one point. But not just value, but derivatives and higher-order derivatives. Right? The error term, of course, looks uh, like it does for all the other ones. And you're going to have to bound higher-order derivatives. And there is this term. So Taylor is actually easier to bound because this term here just explodes in the sense that it's 0 at x0, and it's largest at uh, the, your, your endpoints of the interval, right? This was more difficult for Lagrange, because that was a product of a more difficult looking polynomial. But that's also the reason Lagrange had a nicer looking pattern, because it's a smaller value. So that's how we used. I think you had a few exercises on Taylor on just doing that. Estimate the error term if you approximate. The typical numerical analysis question is that you're trying to compute e to the x, but you have a computer that doesn't know how to well, no computer knows how to do e to the x, right? Because they just know how to multiply and add, and et cetera. So what if, you want it, what if you approximate it by Taylor? Can you put a bound on how bad it can be? 
Anyway, this was new for many of you guys, the floating points. Uh, only one section, but it's kind of nice, and uh, um, you want to go, go through and review how it worked. I just want to, from, from the point of view of the book, there is, it's kind of divided into two. One is to describe how it actually works in the computer, and another is to just m make a model that we use to identify what happens when you keep on making floating point approximations. So what do I mean by that? In the computer, this is really what's going on in the computer. It's base two. It's binary, right? So everything is two to the power of something. Okay. Uh, the number of, of 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 digits, so to speak, to I mean, um, the the digits in the binary digits here are given by exactly what they are in the computer. The the popular double double floating point uh, IEEE standard. And you know, there were a lot of points here. We had a sign bit. We had a we had an exponent, and we had the the mantissa here. And we wrote it in a normalized form to get one plus this f. You had a bunch of exercises figuring out what it means. Uh, it's, it's important to know what's going on, but it's, it's not so easy for us as humans to do simple exercises with. So what they did was that uh, they went on and said, let's just create a little model for this to study it. And that's what came next in that section, namely decimal floating point numbers. So this doesn't exist in the computer, of course. They are all binary. We do this just to be able to study it, and, um, because we like decimal numbers better. So it's kind of equivalent. It's just a different base. Uh, and we don't do as many digits, because that would be hard to write out. So they introduced a model of having uh, you know, k-digit decimal machine numbers. They normalized, actually in a slightly different way, which is confusing. They don't put one point something like we did before, because that one could be one, two, three, all the way up to nine. It's a question of normalization. You want to make sure that you can't write the same number in many different ways. And the way and way to do it is to say that all numbers, think about how do you do this in, um, uh, if you write a, a number in physics, for example, and you have a result. I think many of you normalize such that you write 3.14 times 10 to the power of something, right? So if you think about what you did, you insisted on the first non-zero digit and then the decimal point and then the rest. And the power is whatever it is, OK? And this is not quite doing that. It's insisting on zero point and then is a non-zero digit and then comes power whatever it is. It's just a normalization. Uh, now, how do we represent the errors computers are making? Chopping and rounding, pretty obvious, but it's what we do. You choose a number of digits, and whenever you can't deal with the next digit, you either chop or you round. OK? Um, and we introduced these concepts of, of absolute error. I have a simple exercise, although maybe this is a little too basic, but I'll do it anyway. It's quick, it's quick to write up. Uh, I think this is in the book 1.2.6, problem C. Uh, so they asked with four digits, and they asked for rounding. And they want you to compute a number such as 121. And then we do a minus with a circle around it. And it means that whatever machine you're using, in this case your own made up machine of four digit uh, decimal numbers, right? But of course in a computer it would be, so, so it's, it's not exact. If we write minus on the blackboard, we mean this is math. That's exact, right? I mean, pi minus pi is zero. Everything is exact, whatever these numbers end up being, right? When you start doing these, it means a lot of different things. It means rounding and approximations, et cetera. And that's what you want to study. So in this problem, they do this, three, 0.327. And they subtract those two. And then they do another machine subtraction with 119. And they ask you to do this to begin with. And the way you do it is, of course, that first of all, you would have to round these to three to four digits. They are already four digits or less. So there's no rounding involved here. But in principle, if I wrote pi here instead, you would have to first round the pi, right? Because the machine doesn't know what, what uh, infinite number of digits is, right? It has to be stored in the computer. Then you have to subtract them. And then you have to do whatever truncation or rounding. But we were asked to round to four digits. So this is easy. You can all see that it's going to be 120.6 something. And uh, after rounding, you can see actually here a lot, a lot of loss of precision. You could write this out quite carefully as 120.673 uh, or something, right? But you realize that you're going to round this to four digits anyway, and all you get left, left is 120.7. Okay? So we kind of, this is the idea of losing accuracy. These two sevens here didn't matter. Okay? And it's exactly what happens in the computer when we lose those last digits at the end. It's just that the computer has many more digits. Uh, and then you got to do the next one. And here's also a lot of loss of precision in the sense that you're subtracting two almost equal numbers. So what's going to happen, even if the true result here, um, 
uh, well, this will actually get away with it. So there's no additional errors coming from this. It's exactly 1.7. But of course, compared to what we did up here, it was quite a big of uh, chopping. In order to put a number on that, so this is, the way to read this is, uh, I don't know the, how to pronounce it, but it's like uh, machine or, or floating point subtraction. That's probably how we would pronounce it. 121, floating point subtraction, uh, 0 0.327, et cetera, right? And that, that's how you think about it. Yeah. When they're close together? Yeah. When you subtract. That's great. And that's, what, that's, the, that's what's called cancellation. And it's kind of one of the, bi the biggest problems. And this example is meant to show it. Uh, the reason this is meant to show it, you'll see when we do the relative errors. Uh, um, th these are not close together. So even if it looked like I made a big error here, I didn't in a relative sense. Because 0 0.027 is a small number compared to this, right? But then I subtract 119, and the result is this. Now suddenly, those 0 0.027 are, are quite significant, right? So that's why it's, it's called cancellation. And I, I even have it a little bit on the slides. At the bottom here, you have a little bit of description from the book describing that when you subtract two almost large equal numbers, you get a number that is very small, and in a relative sense, it's just bad. So, so that, that's what's going on. Now, so, so what I just said here is this idea of relative accuracy saying that even if this error, it, when we did this, it looked like I made all the error here, right? I did no, not make more errors here. Why was subtracting to, with 119 so much worse? It looked like this was exact. Nothing really happened. And the answer is relatively. The answer is that what you're comparing to now is relatively different. So the relative accuracy after this subtraction was on the order of 10 to the minus 4. It sounds bad with a, making an error of 0 0.024, 27 here, right? But relative to what you're asking for, it's really just on the order of, we still have four digits. Now, if you realize that here you make the same error, right? Because it's just a subtraction. But compared to this number, that's you know, 100 times bigger. The way they formalize this is by doing relative error. So the absolute error is an obvious definition. It's the, you know, whatever you got minus what you were, you were supposed to get, and that's, of course, I mean, if you really did plug in the true values here. So the absolute value is, is a number. And that is sometimes interesting. But I did tell you that if you're measuring the distance from Earth to Sun, maybe you don't want an absolute error. Maybe you want to see how it relates to uh, the actual value that you're looking at. So then we define relative error by dividing by what you expect. So in this case, that's going to be 0 0.027 divided by, and what we're expecting is really this number, although strictly speaking, you have to divide by the true number you expect. So it has to be not your approximation, but the true one, right? And we see that this is kind of significant. Now we're making more than 1% of an error, even if we thought, but four digits, it sounds like we're making errors of the order of one ten thousandth every time, right? But because of this cancellation, we now made an error of 100. And we introduced the idea of significant digits. If you look at a number like this, deciding how many significant digits should be trivial, but I agree that there's, it can be messed up. But, but if, you, if you get a relative error, that immediately translates into number of significant digits from the definition. And the answer is that it is less than 0 0.5, it has at least one significant digit. If it's less than 0 0.05, it has at least two. If it's less than 0 0.005, which is not, then it has three digits. So this one has two significant digits. And I just want to warn you that I think that's a term that you use hand-wavingly always. You look at the number and say, oh, it looks like five significant digits. In this course, we made it uh, strict by this definition. All right? Uh, you know, you did a bunch of examples like that, and it, it's, fairly, it's fairly straightforward. Um, last section of chapter one, start introducing these ideas that show up a lot. Uh, we want to put numbers on errors. I think many people are still a little confused about the idea of the uh, order notation, uh, bounding things by just the first term that doesn't, that the most significant term. So for sequence, uh, just to put this in, in, in uh, context, we did a lot of sequences in chapter two, didn't we? Why? Because we were solving equations by starting at the P0 and then we iterated P1, P2, maybe a thousand times, right? Hopefully not a thousand times. Anyway, that's a sequence of numbers. 
and you want to say something about that sequence. Hopefully, you want to say that it converges to a number that you're interested in. Think Newton or fixed point, right? So that's a sequence of number converging to a desired number, right? And then uh, in terms of notation, we want to talk about how quickly this sequence, let's say alpha n, converges to the true answer alpha or, or the actual limit alpha. And we bound it by some sort of function. So this is more abstract, but in practice, we often put in certain expressions here. For example, 1 over n to a power would be a certain rate of convergence here. Uh, we also write it with an order notation. And I think it's good to realize that there might be higher order terms here, but they go away in the limit. So for large n here means that you can actually take the most significant one. And of course, this mimics completely on what we've been doing more recently, namely replacing the sequence by a function and the n by an h. And it's, it's, it's completely analogous. The, n goes to, the h goes to 0 instead of the n going to infinity. It's now a function. It's not a sequence of numbers. This f of h, which you might want to see as, let's say, whatever, forward difference approximation of the derivative, right? So f of h here is equal to uh, little f of a point plus h minus yourself divided by h. Remember the forward difference for derivatives. Uh, the true answer L is the actual derivative. And you want to figure out, you know that this is a good approximation, right? If h is really small, it gets better and better. But how quickly? And the answer is expressed by this here, which in that example ends up being just something times h, because it's a linear method. And the reason we do this is that we want to be able to say, here's another method, the center difference, that has h squared, and therefore it's better. Okay? And the order notation really just captures the first term and, and bounds it all by that, because all the other one. And there is an, I found an example in the book that kind of shows that. It's, little, it's not a typical example, but I think it sheds some light on this issue. So let's do it. Um, one, three, four, problem A. They say, suppose that you have a number p, and you have a q that is less than p. And then you give me one of these functions, f, such that f of h is a limit plus ordo h p. Okay? And now they want you to show that f of h is the limit plus ordo h q. So to some of you, maybe this is completely trivial. But I can imagine some of you might say, what? I thought it was order HP. How, and now I say that it's order HQ. How can I write both of these things? Q and P are not the same. How can I be allowed to write that F of H is something and then that it's something else? You see why it comes from the definition. And of course, the fact that Q is smaller than P. Uh, in words, if something is H square accurate, it's also order H accurate. Because the definition of ordo is really just that it's bounded by something. And when h is small, uh, h is, you know, h to the 1 is just much bigger than h squared. So of course, you can bound it by something to a smaller power. Right? And this goes when we did all this. Uh, I think it reminds a lot of all these uh, Richardsons where, that we did, where you know, we have a bunch of terms. We try to eliminate. Ordo is really just taking the most significant one and replacing the entire tail by just ordo that. Uh, I mean, formally, formally, if you want to prove this, you've got to go back to the definition. Uh, you know, what does it mean for sufficiently small h? It's, it's really one of those, uh, basically going back to the definition of limits, right? Where we say that there is a delta such that as h is less. There is a delta. Uh, if, if you give me a delta, you can always find a k such that this is, is, this is true. Okay, and here is just summarized a little shorter to to to, uh, to emphasize that. Here's what I would write it. Um, so there is a constant and a delta such that this f is really close to L in the exact sense of that. Okay. So what was the deal with all this? Well, you would like to say that it's you would like to look at this and say that it's L plus a constant times h to the p, but it's not. It's L plus a constant times h to the p plus higher order terms. But what that means is that if h gets small enough, you can replace it by just a bigger constant probably and the leading order term from the definition. 
And now it's pretty clear that can you also then say that it's less than or equal to this times h to a smaller power? What is the formal trick for actually fitting it in the same framework? So in order to show that it's also equal to order h to the q, of course, I, I, I got to replace that by a q. Okay? And the way I do it is to just say that, okay, let's say that this is smaller than, a certain, these h's are smaller than our delta. I should probably put that here, where h is um, less than delta. You can just pull out the remaining q's. Let's say p is 2 and q is 1. You take out a delta from that p, and you can replace it by q. That's, but but it's in, in, we all we'll know as h goes to 0, you've done these limits proofs in calculus a lot, that, you know, h plus h square. I don't know exactly what tricks you did if you divided away one of the h's and saw that one of them uh, was dominating the other one. But it's clear that, that, you know, this delta can just go into the constant. So let me just write that sentence. So uh, then you can also write this f of h minus l as, and we want to write it as h to the q, right? And there is a constant. But in order to do it, you've got to take out the delta to make that happen. And it's going to be exactly p minus q of those. OK, so this is a new constant. I don't know what we want to call it. You know. K1. And it's still when h is small enough. And this is another way to say that f of h is also L plus ordo h to the q. OK? So all this writing was just meant to show one thing that the definition allows me to change this constant as I see pleased as long as it's a constant. And as long as q is smaller, I can, of course, pull out some sort of bound on these h's as many times as I wish and replace the p by a smaller number. Can I play the same game if q is larger? Intuitively, obviously, I cannot. Order h2 is not order. A constant times h square cannot be bounded by a constant times h cube. OK? And that's, that's exactly the problem. And, and what would happen here is, of course, that this would be divided by, by, by delta instead. And there would not be a nice constant to bound it by. But, um, Anyway, I think this is good because it, it came back on the Richardson and all of that. Um, the idea, what it just means with order notation. Taylor tells you that a function is really a constant plus something h plus something h squared, etc. right? You can quit wherever you want and say it's order h to the p. It doesn't mean that it's a constant times h to the p. It means that you want to just write a, a, a rough bound for everything else. But it's not that rough because it's really the leading order term. So for our Richardson examples, we often, I don't remember exactly how, there were so many different problems, but uh, I know there was one problem where they wrote out, for example, I should know the number, but there was an exercise last week where you had to do Richardson to find a new finite difference approximation for a derivative. And they wrote out a formula, maybe it was the center of the forward difference, and they said plus something times h. And they said plus something times h squared. And then they said plus ordo h3. Okay? And many people thought that that function was order h3 accurate. It was not. You see why, right? So I think it was something like this, that they decided that, um, I'm just making this up, but f prime at some point of x, it might have been something like this, divided by h. And then they said some number, and I don't remember what it was, so I'm just going to call it k1. But this is equally well representing. Here were actual numbers, minus uh, half of f second derivative or something. Uh, this example here is exactly what I'm talking about here. This is, not an, this, is, this is not an order h3 accurate approximation of the derivative. It's order h. It's just linear. It's just that they decided to write this out because you were doing Richardson, and you better know these numbers then because you're eliminating them, right? It doesn't, doesn't change the fact that this is your k. Uh, or sorry, f. This is your limit, what you want it to be. And the difference is order h. All right? And almost always, these functions are powers of h. 
That was the chapter one stuff. But it's, uh, it's really leads up to a lot of later stuff and a lot of difficulties. So even if it's just three sections, I, I think it's, uh, they're quite important. Uh, this I'm going to go through pretty quickly. Let's see, I did an example on the fixed point. So let's, uh, by section, it, you, you did programming assignments on it. You should understand this inside and out, and I think you do. Uh, it's not that weird. Uh, but don't forget the main points, namely that you need two points uh, with different signs on the function. Uh, what are the properties of bisection? It's extremely robust if you get that far right. Unlike Newton, it can never run away. In fact, we have a theorem proving that if you just start correctly and the function is continuous, you will find a root. Okay? And what was the main mathematical foundation for saying that? Yeah, exactly. Because if you have a point a positive and a point negative and it's continuous in between, it better pass all the values in between on the way, right? Does it find, what if there are many roots? Will it find them all? No. And can you control which one you find? You could look at it, but it's, overall this theorem doesn't say that. It will be kind of random what it does. It will just make sure that it always has a positive and a negative, and it will narrow down on it. Kind of nice. Uh, of course, it fits our notation from before in the sense that we're trying to compute a true number p, which is the root, and we have a theorem saying that we will do it, in the sense that it will be better and better, and the rate is exactly this. You divide an error by two all the time. Of course, order here hides the fact that it's a b minus a, but that's what we're allowed to do with order notation. So what you need to know is that every iteration you divide the error by two. And you should know that Newton might be much worse, because Newton might not work. Newton might multiply the error by 1,000 and just explode, right? But when you get close, multiplying the error by 2 is pretty pathetic compared to Newton. Because you know Newton that you have 10 to the minus 2 error. You take one step, you have 10 to the minus 4. That's a factor of 100. You take another step, you have a factor of 10 to the minus 8, and you're done. That's a factor of 10,000. So you know, it's quite different. Quadratic convergence and multiplying by 2s, or dividing by 2s. This, of course, was the foundation for almost the entire rest of the chapter, not just as a method fixed point iteration, but because we analyze Newton by turning it into fixed point. And it's also one of the more favorite type of problems uh, in the homeworks and the exams and everything to just see if you guys get it. We did a lot of exercises on the window and the theorem, and it's actually not that complicated. You got to know what a fixed point iteration is, and I think all of you do that. That's pretty clear. You have some sort of g of p, and you're looking for point p such that p is equal to g of p. Okay? And so, sorry I said the word iteration. So far we don't talk about iterations. This is just a fixed point problem. A fixed point means that g of p is equal to p. It's just like saying I want the root of f of x. That means that f of x is equal to 0. If you want, I want the fixed point of g of p, you want g of p equals p. So that, that's obvious, right? So first we got some, a theorem talking about whether a function has a fixed point. I mean, as, uh, that's interesting in itself. And realize there, is, there are no iterations. What's confusing is that it's exactly the same conditions that come later when we talk about the iteration. But for now, let's just see, do, is there a fixed point? And there are a lot of conditions here, but you, you, you're quite used to them. Just you know, make sure you know them well. The idea here is that if your g is mapping to itself, it's the window. Think about, if you ever forget that condition, just think about the window and the proof, which said that uh, you want to find, fixed points means that you're not finding zeros. A root problem would look for when a curve intersects this line, right? And the only difference between that and, and fixed point is that you're looking for when a curve intersects this line, right? y is equal to x. And then here is your g of x, and this would be the fixed point p. And the way these theorems work is that they tell you that you must give an interval. And actually, sometimes that was difficult. In your homework, sometimes they did not tell you the interval. That makes it hard. Many of you asked how are we supposed to find it. And the answer is, we don't give you recipes for that. But you can play around. You could, of course, look to see a proc. It was, wasn't that hard after all. But, but I'm just saying that, that that's an extra difficulty. Uh, and then, of course, realizing this theorem was quite easy. Because you draw this box. And you say that g of x maps to itself. By that, we mean that if you plug in an x between a and b, you end up between a and b. It's a quite special. If you take a random function, that's not likely to happen, right? I mean, this function does not do that, OK? 
If you plug in between A and B, it gives you negative numbers, right? It's, it's, it's just not the right thing. This does not do that. It's kind of there, but it's still going outside the box up here. So it's a quite a special property to map to itself. Uh, if you do that, you have a fixed point. What was the main fundamental <laughs> mathematical foundation for that? If you do map to yourself, you have a fixed point. Remember the trick? It sounds a lot like, by, like intermediate, intermediate value theorem, doesn't it? You have to subtract x and look at the difference here that goes from positive to negative, right? So if you look at the function g minus x, that's, and just apply uh, intermediate value theorem, you realize it must have a fixed point. All right, the next step, that was existence. The next one was to say it's, there's only one. And why do we want to know that? Mainly because the iterations need to know that it converges. If there are two fixed points inside here, that would be very confusing. So if you have a G that does this, that of course you can have, right? You have a lot of fixed points. Is there a condition we can put on G so, that, so we know that doesn't happen? And there are, might be many conditions, but it's not, a, it's not about, uh, you know, that this implies that there, is a two, there are two fixed points. But if you have a derivative that never goes above one, I'm claiming that can never happen. Okay? And the reason is, of course, that the derivative, if it goes below here, it must increase above one in order to get back up to the curve. So these are the conditions we're using to show existence and uniqueness. And they turn out to be the same conditions as fixed point iteration converging. So now we talk about fixed point iteration. It's the very simple idea of taking one of these g's and keep on plugging into the same number over, over and over. Remember the calculator pressing cos all the time or in MATLAB typing cos of x, x equals cos of x, right? That's what fixed point iteration is. So it's very, very straightforward. It's pretty obvious that if it converges, it converges to a fixed point. If it stops changing, it must be a fixed point because p is equal to cos of p, right? Uh, you don't even need a MATLAB code for this. You just write it yourself. Um, and here's the theorem that if you think about it, it says almost a, uh, it says identical things to, to in the uniqueness theorem before, okay? But you need the uniqueness to in, in order to say that. And then the result is that um, it will convert. If you start anywhere between A and B, it will convert to the unique fixed point. All right? It also tells you how quickly it converges. And roughly, you know how you remember, I mean, the way you see these things here is really just that you're bounding. What is it doing per iteration? It's multiplying by k. That's the role of the k. And the analysis pointed that out pretty easily. And these expressions show it easily. The error each time you make an iteration goes down by a factor of k. Maybe better, but we can prove this. Okay? And the big question between these two here is just what is the constant? Because if you want an actual number, so if you want to, you could just say order k to the n, and you're fine. But if you actually want to put a number on it, you need the width. And there are two forms of it, right? And you did exercises on this. But just think about it. It's really just k to the n, multiplying by k each iteration. Um, did I have an exercise on this? Yeah, let me do a quick one on that. So you've done many, but they are kind of typical anyway. Um, what did I find here? 227 uh, show that this function, g of x is equal to pi plus 0 0.5 sine x half has a unique fixed point between 0 and 2 pi. OK? You see that this is not asking about fixed point iteration, but it won't really make a big difference to you guys. So an equivalent way could be, say, show that it converges to the unique root, the unique fixed point, for any initial condition. And it would be an equivalent problem almost. But now they are, strictly speaking, not asking about that, but about this theorem, right? So you just do all of that. Uh, well, g of x, it's pi plus 0 0.5 times something. And that something seems to go, there's an x there. That something seems to, you can see various patterns here. Um, in fact, now that I look at it, I see that it seems that it will only go up to between 0 and pi. So that sign will always be positive, actually. So you could probably make this stricter, but I didn't. I just said that clearly. It's going to stay between pi minus 0 0.5 and pi 
plus 0 0.5, right? And 0 0.5 is less than pi, so this is between 0 and 2 pi, right? So g of x, it maps to itself. So that's the first step. And as I said, that's a, not a likely to happen for a random one. Then you go on to the derivative, and that's something like 0 0.25 times cos. And how do we bound this? Well, these numbers are easy. You see that you can't be too smart here. Even if it goes between 0 and 2, this guy is going to hit 1 at some point anyway. So this, um, and it can also be negative. Maybe it can't be negative. Yeah, this one can be negative for sure, because it goes all the way to minus. Not that it matters, because it's still staying well away from 1 in magnitude. Right? Which means that you can bound this g prime of x absolute by a number k, and you can actually set it equal to um, two quarter. And that number is less than one, which means that you're fine for x. If you want to be careful, you have to always write this, but of course, it doesn't really matter for these functions. And that means that you're done. All right, that's not too hard. Uh, this was easy because I bounded them. You had harder exercises where it was actually quite difficult just pointing out in general to show this can be much harder sometimes. Because what are you doing? This is the reason we talked about optimization in chapter one. You're proving that a function between A and B stays between A and B. That's a maximization, minimization type problem. And in general, you might have to look at the endpoints and extrema, right? That's just what it is. I was lucky because I could just bound it. It was just an easy problem. And if you really think about it, this is the same. You, have, you take a derivative, and you get a new function. And you get to show that it's never above 1 or below minus 1. That's also maximization, minimization. And in general, it can be quite hard. And in general, you might actually need to compute a second derivative, right, to find the extreme of that. Hopefully, we, we try to you know, make it sometimes easier. Many of your homework problems were monotonic. You could just look at it and look at the endpoint. But you need the arguments to maximize. Uh, that is the, the k condition is, is contraction, is, yeah, k less than 1. Uh, yeah, the definition is basically that you're plugging in two different numbers, and the difference between the function values is strictly less than the difference in the, in the values, yeah. Showing that a k, uh, this k is less than 1 on an interval means, implies that, yeah. Good. Um, anyway, uh, so this means unique fixed point in 0, 0.25. Five. Now let's use this theorem to tell us how many iterations. So now you start iterating. And now you ask a uh, number of iterations for error less than 10 to the minus 2, starting at p0 equals pi. How do you do that? Just plug into the formula, right? So the formula is saying that Pn minus, pi, mi minus P is going to be um, uh, less than or equal to K to the N times max of this expression here. And I don't know which one you want to pick, but let's do this one, P minus P0. Because you're starting in the middle, so this is just pi regardless, right? And you want it to be 10 to the minus 2. So let's set it equal to, and the K was a quarter to the n times pi, right? That's what you do. And then you get the number. 4.15. How do you round 4.15 if I'm asking for number of iterations? It's obvious, but I think it's so deeply ingrained in you to do rounding correctly since elementary school that it might be easy to just say 4, and 4 is wrong. You have not proven that it will converge to that accuracy within four iterations. It's fine. All right, uh, we moved on with uh, Newton, of course, we derived in so many ways. Ge geometrically looking at the tangent. Taylor gave us this, right? And, and, and one nice conclusion to all of this is that, well, you can just look at Newton and realize that it is fixed point iteration, which with a pretty funky looking g of x. 
And one of the nice conclusions here that the book, I think, does really well is to show that this is a really natural thing to do because you want to turn it into a fixed point. You want to solve a root problem, f of x equals 0. And you want to do it by a fixed point iteration, g of x equal x. So the way we do that is that we, for example, do x minus something, something times f. And then they show that that something must be minus 1 over derivative of f. Okay? And the way they did it, uh, and there is a theorem. This theorem, you know, we actually did prove it. I mentioned it's quite useless in practice because it doesn't tell you what delta is. Nevertheless, it does guarantee quadratic convergence of Newton if you start close enough. And what is the other big condition? What can Newton fail on? Here, right? It might still work, but if that happens, you lose the quadratic convergence if, 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 if the derivative is equal to 0. So that came later. But with these conditions, it's kind of strong to be able to say that Newton really converges quadratically. Um, we looked at variance, the secant method, and false, the regular falsy we didn't cover. Um, but in order to look at this a little bit more and talk about quadratically convergent, um, I know many people mix up with rate of convergence, but order of convergence is this notion, that some sequences can just extremely quickly, more than just multiplying by k is one thing. But this is something much stronger, right? So if you look at this definition, if you set alpha to 1, that's linear convergence. And it really means that you multiply by lambda each time. So you see that the good old fixed point thing and even the bisection really corresponds to first order convergence where the n plus 1 error is, you know, approximately lambda times the nth error. But if you bring up alpha above that, you get a completely different behavior. And that's what we call order of convergence. And we're looking, of course, mostly at 2 and maybe 3 uh, in, uh, to see what type of uh, sequences we get here. And it, it, this is what gives Newton. This is why Newton gives you 10, 0 0.01 and then 0 0.0001 and then 10 to the minus 8, and then it nails everything, right? It's squaring the error and multiplying by a constant, as opposed to linear convergence uh, series that are just multiplying by a factor over and over. Big difference. Um, we had various theorems saying that fixed point, if you don't have a zero derivative at the fixed point, you will only get linear convergence. We also had a theorem saying that if you do have a zero and some other conditions, we do get quadratic convergence. And this is an alternative way to derive Newton. Because then you just set up that you want a fixed point iteration of this form and you have no idea what phi is. But you know that the derivative must be zero at the fixed point. And that means you can derive the Newton's method straight from there. There are so many different ways to derive Newton, and for you guys it should be an opportunity to just understand it completely from all types of directions. It's, uh, it's, uh, it fits together, of course, so it's not, but, but I think it's nice to just, it's such an important method. Nice to show all these uh, parts of it. Um, we went on and talked about some issues. You have um, multiplicities of zeros, then you get a problem, because then you, then you don't have a non-zero derivative, and Newton fails its quadratic convergence. And remember, we rescued that with this alternative formulation of Newton. And you did at least one exercise on this, I think, where if you know that you have a zero derivative, and the simplest case here is, of course, that you're just trying to solve x squared equals zero, right? You can make it harder if you wish, but, but x squared equal to zero will get this problem. Because it has a zero, zero at zero, but it also has a zero derivative. So Newton does not like solving x squared equals zero. This sequence won't mind. It will still be quadratic convergence. Uh, what else? We talked about Aitken. You have a linearly. Aitken, it fits in here because it's applied to fixed point iteration. Okay? But in terms of the general thing, Aitken is not a way to solve equations, right? It could have been in chapter one. It's about the idea that you have a linearly convergent sequence and you want to speed it up. So it's here just for pedagogical reasons, I'm sure. But the idea is very simple. You really have a sequence, whatever, and you approximate that this lambda is the same over and over when you're close enough. And then you can solve for a new, better iteration. OK? And exactly how good it is can be discussed, uh, or when we want to use it. But suppose you actually know that you just have a linearly converging sequence. This, this can be quite powerful. Uh, delta notation comes later, of course, the way to remember Aitken, by just writing it like this. Um, and there's a theorem telling you that it does get better in some sense. It doesn't turn it into Newton. It's not like you take a fixed point iteration and suddenly you get quadratic, but you get something in between. And, and that's what it does. Now, 
what was the main thing when we did 8 gun? So we could run a fixed point iteration and get a long linearly converging se sequence, and you could then take 8 gun and run on that, right? And the observation we made that that seems stupid because you do three of these uh, fixed points and you do one 8 gun. Why on earth do we want to continue with this number here when this one is so much better? So then you just threw that away and you took this number and did two iterations, you got three new numbers, 8 gun, etc., right? That's Stephenson's method. So uh, that's quite a powerful method, actually. The notation is messy, but I, I'm sure you guys know. If nothing else from the MATLAB code, it's so easy to do. Two steps to fixed point, eight gun, repeat. OK? Throw away, when you repeat, you throw away everything old. So, so that's Stephenson. Um, it's, a, it's a particular combination of fixed point and, and eight gun. Uh, very powerful method. It can give quadratic convergence. And I mentioned I wasn't even sure why this method is not, I, I am sure that this method is not used that much, and I'm not sure why. My only guess is that it doesn't generalize to systems as well. Uh, finally, in the last section of chapter two, they look at polynomials. And you realize that everything we've done so far is general. We don't really talk about f and x and g of x being anything particular. Okay? But if they are something particular, you can probably do better. And polynomials is a special case. You typically want a routine that finds all the roots of a polynomial. And you have them in MATLAB. I, show, I used it a lot. It's called roots. But, but the, there, there are a few things coming out of this. First of all, there are some theory that you should know from algebra. But, but uh, this uh, Horner's method, of course, is we mentioned for very re some reasons. One is that it's a very fast way to evaluate the polynomial. You think that it's messy compared to just plugging in, but it's actually fewer operations. Okay, so it's a good way to, up, to evaluate. You can also easily evaluate the derivative. Why is, why is that good? Who wants to evaluate polynomials and their derivatives? Why do we need them both? Well, for many reasons. But for solving for roots, that may, leads you to thinking about methods that want a polynomial and their derivative. And that's Newton, right? So it can lead to a very efficient Newton's method by using Horner's method. But the other big thing was really that Horner automatically does a division by x minus x0 for you, where x0 is your current point. And that means that if you find a root, meaning that this b0 is so small that you say, I'm done. This is a root. You can just divide away that root and get a new lower degree q that you repeat the process on. And I did mention this would have been a great programming assignment that we didn't do. But in principle, it allows you to find all the roots of a 10th degree polynomial without guessing too much about initial conditions. Okay? Remember I said, a polynomial is here. Newton will probably find one root for you, but how can you find the other ones, right? And this is the way to do it. You find it, and you remove it from the polynomial. Um, it's described on this slide here. It's called deflation. But when you find a root that you like, you just divide it out and keep on going. When do you stop? Probably when you have a quadratic factor left, because you have a formula for that. And in fact, that gives you an opportunity to find two imaginary roots at the end, if you need to. But of course, uh, maybe one, of the more, one motivation for this Miller's method was to find more of them, just like Newton, but fitting, or actually just like secant method, but fitting parabola instead of straight line. So you give me three points, I fit a, Q, a parabola, and I compute not one, but two roots, right? And one nice thing here that you maybe experienced in your exercises was that they can actually go complex using the quadratic formula. Okay, So that's one motivation for doing this. Another is that it might converge fast. Uh, but the truth is that you can get away with the previous method for solving. Just with Newton, you could, you could find these methods. But the main argument here would be the complex roots. Uh, many people, uh, there are a lot of formulas in the book here. You, I don't want you to remember all those formulas. I want you to know this method. And in worst case, for some simple case, you could, you could you know, fit the polynomial by yourself, right? If I give you three points, you know how to fit a polynomial, OK? And then you can solve it, and, and there is your own Miller's method. In the book, they derive all the expressions, and there's a computer code. That, that type of memorization is not very helpful. All right? You know chapter two perfectly well now? This is, I mean, this is way beyond any speed that is recommended, but you guys know it already. That's why I'm going so fast. And of course, I won't have time to go all the way to the end, which is fine, because We've been covering that so much recently. But let me say a few words about um, interpolation. This whole chapter uh, started off by motivating why polynomials are amazing. And I think you've seen it. It's not the only thing to do, but they are certainly very nice. Because 
in chapter four, we need to differentiate and integrate. And polynomials are excellent for that. We ended up very many times in chapter four having to integrate polynomials, and we just said, fine, we know how to do it. Okay? If you fit something else, it might not happen. So, but so far, we're just going to do about fitting. So basically, you have a bunch of points or a function or something, and you want to approximate it by something simpler, in this case, a polynomial. Um, you knew this in high school, that you can fit the polynomial of degree n to n plus 1 points. If nothing else, by just counting coefficient, and I think the method you would have used was to set up a big linear system and solve it. And you can do that. Uh, we're teaching you better methods here. Uh, better for different reasons. One is an explicit way to just write down the polynomial. We use this a lot when proving various theorems about error terms. The idea of these weird L's here that have the property that they're 1 and then 0. 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0. 0, 0, 0 1, 0. It's 1 at one point and 0 at all the other ones. Very nice little polynomial because you just keep on multiplying it by function values and you get interpolating polynomials by linearity. Having said that, if you just want to find a polynomial interpolating 10 points, or 5, this might not be your easiest way. It might not be the way you want to write it. It's a very specific form to write it in terms of these L's. You might not want that. But, but it's useful for many other ways. Uh, there's an error term I mentioned before, Taylor. This is completely analogous to that. Maybe the big difference here is that this term looks different. And it actually makes it a little harder for you to find error bounds. Because you're going to have to, while this derivative, the xi, you don't know anything about, right? So typically, this here, you just bound by the worst case. This, however, you're going to have to maximize. And the reason that's important is that it can actually be quite uh, much smaller than the obvious one. So remember in Taylor, it was x minus x0 to some power. And I said, you just put in the largest value, and you maximized it, right? This is a more complicated pattern. And I think we had a few examples where we actually differentiated it, and, and, and we find the extrema. But it's really fairly, it's still just math 1a. There's an error. The xi is annoying, but you just replace it by the worst case. What you have left is a function of x. It's actually a polynomial. And, and uh, you just got to figure out how bad it is. That's how you find errors. And this is, of course, important. Every time in physics or whatever where you fit the polynomial through points, this allows you to say that you know that the error cannot be larger than something. Uh, we had this recursive ID that led up to Neville's method. Uh, let me not do that right now, but go to divided. This I mentioned was, the, I think, the easiest way to write the polynomial. And I might, you'll see on the old exams that it's quite popular to ask uh, relatively easy problems, but they can be made difficult. But, 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 but the relatively easy problem is find the polynomial going through a bunch of points, right? And if it's formulated that way, you can use whatever method you want. And I think you want to use this method usually. Uh, it depends a little bit, though. Uh, I think in my last exam, if you have done that already, you'll see there's a pretty big one with, I think it's a fifth degree polynomial. And it would be fun to see if someone else could do that easier, because with this method, it's like, it takes one minute or two. That's so, so I think this is the easiest way by hand to write this. And it's based on a, writing it in a very specific form that I said, be, said before, it might not be the form you want. Just like the Lagrange might not be, well, maybe you want a plus bx plus cx squared, et cetera. Well, you're not going to get it. You're going to get this. And you can, of course, expand it if you want to. But the simplicity was, was very nice. Here's the final expression. You compute all these divided differences according to special rules. And at the end, you just take all the ones on the top of your diagram, namely the divided differences f of x0, f of x0, x1, et cetera. And you multiply them by adding in these factors here, x minus x0 times x minus x1. It's hard to describe in words. Um, there was a MATLAB code for it. We did many examples on the blackboard where you basically can write out this triangular array of numbers, and you can grab the top row and write down the polynomial. Quite powerful technique. Uh, there's a MATLAB code for it, and, and it's, it's a great exper uh, exercise in MATLAB to see that this is doing exactly that. Maybe the only tricky thing is to see exactly how you divide by those x differences there. But that's a nice way to find these. This, I said, it's meant to make it easier, and it's confusing everybody. Uh, I'm reserving the right to, to you know, ask you questions about it, namely, you know, use the Newton forward difference formula, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, having said that, it's really identical to divided differences. So if all you're doing is fitting, fitting points, I mean, the first, the logical step would be to say, if they are equidistant, yay, then you can use this. But if I didn't force you to do it, you can use the old one and just divide and, and, and ignore this formula for now. But the idea was that you want to avoid all those annoying div d uh, divisions here. It's really based on good old hand calculations, where dividing by weird numbers is messy. 
So it rewrote it in a form where your only differences come in form of you don't divide by numbers, basically. That was the motivation of it. And you can read through it, and you had exercise on it, so you know how to do it. But I, I recognize that, that you guys think it's almost more complicated with these binomial coefficients and everything than just doing divided differences. Um, I guess if I wanted to force you guys really to do this, if I was mean, I would choose annoying numbers to divide by to, so that if you did divide it, you would get stuck. But you know, I'm not sure that's the game I want to play. But anyway. Another big part here was Hermit and fitting. Uh, so this leads halfway to Taylor, right? Lagrange, everything we've done so far fits polynomials through points. What if you now tell me you want to fit slopes as well? OK? So that's something you can do. And you can just count degrees of freedom and get it out. In general, you can fit as many derivatives as you want. And two extreme cases pop out. You have Taylor, where you only have one point, but a lot of derivatives. You have Lagrange interpolating polynomials, where you never have derivatives. You just fit through a bunch of points, right? But you have anything in between. And the popular case is that you put one derivative and value on each point. That leads to Hermit. Okay? I think in an old exam, I mixed and had derivative at some point and not on others. You can do whatever you want. And in principle, you can just count degrees of freedom. The first thing you should do for such an exercise is to count degrees of freedom. Right? You know, the number of conditions is equal to the number of coefficients, really. We had expressions for Hermit that you could use. Uh, they end up being, it's like the else, but much worse. Uh, I did want to emphasize the amazing trick of computing these using divided differences. So if I tell you not just values, if you like divided differences, you understand it fully. And now I suddenly tell you, guess what? I want the derivative equal to 5 on this point as well. It's very easy to get into this frame. And here's the slide. And you did exercises on it. Um, put an extra point, And whenever you're about to divide by 0, replace by the derivative. That's kind of the rule. OK, so look through that. But it's an, it's, I think this is very hard to beat. If I give you random points and derivatives uh, that you want to fit, it can easily be done. Uh, splines, you are, of course, all experts on now from the programming assignment and, and various other parts. Uh, many of you ask questions on how, what could I possibly ask on an exam. And you'll see the homework problems you had were actually typical exam problems. They, were like, they, give, they help you halfway. But of course, you couldn't solve that big linear system for more than did I do just two? I think I did two. I had, I had two, two intervals. So I had eight coefficients, right? And it ended up being quite messy if you don't use all the nice tricks from the book. So typical exercises here would give you some of the, you'll see on all the old exams, because these questions are kind of popular. But you know, maybe you're, what we want to emphasize is that you know what a spline is and its properties. So this slide is super important. You should just know what's going on, right? A spline has continuity, not just in values, but in derivatives and second derivatives. If you count up degree of freedom, you see that you're missing two. And you have to do something at the end point, And that's a little iffy. Someone has to tell you what to do. And there are two options we studied, right? Now, in a typical exercise, in order to get you to do numbers here, we would help you with some easy numbers or something. Um, let's, um, so, so these expressions, I'm not saying they wouldn't help you in a practical situation. This is what I did in my computer code. But the fact that I did the big 8 by 8 there shows you that I think it's more important to know where the equations come from and the properties than actually an efficient method to do this by hand. Uh, clamped and, and natural were two of those special cases. Um, parametric, there is a section that is not included. They talk about, it's called parametric curves. Uh, they talk, talk about um, something called Bessier curves and computer graphics. We did the programming assignment that you have due today. Uh, it's, uh, it's the perfect way to do this, I think. You learn about splines and you, you apply them to x and y in order to do curves, right? So, so that's definitely covered, but the, the, their chapter on Bessier curves and stuff, we will not cover so much. Um, I know you guys are sick and tired, but uh, let's just say, if I should say something important for you guys on, um, yeah, let me say something about Richardson. Uh, all these derivative formulas, some people ask, should I memorize these terms? Eh, barely, but you did use them, right? But here's the thing, I could, a really typical problem, I would say, between easy and moderately easy would be to derive the top formula here. And if you then remember those three, four, one coefficients, of course, that would help you. So I'm not going to say that it's not, that you don't have to remember it. But uh, you know, it's, I don't really like to just ask. And you look at the old exam, you'll see that we don't really want you guys to just memorize too much. But uh, you, know, you could also be asked to derive an error term here. And of course, if you didn't know the exact form, it would help you, but you would get away from not doing it. Uh, 
If you look at these Richardson that I want to mention, a nice exercise that I was about to do, but I don't have time to show it, was uh, uh, if you want to do x tries 4 to uh, 4 to, I hope I don't, didn't assign that, pro well maybe I did. Anyway, um, in 4 to 10, it's really just doing something that is forcing you guys to go through this all over again. Because many of you are remembering formulas. And let me emphasize this, because it was a lot of confusion last week. If you have a sequence with error terms h, h square, h cube, etc., that it wasn't emphasized this clearly in the book, then when you do the extrapolation, and the elimination, you get this formula coming out of it. And there's a two there. Typical example is forward differences. Okay? But there are many other sequences that would have that form. Now, then we said, what if you find a sequence that only had the even ones? Then you eliminate not h, but h2. And it ends up being a different formula with a four there. Okay? Now, if you want to use these formulas, if it fits the pattern, that's great. Okay? But in this particular problem, they just force you to redo the whole elimination by saying, instead of h half, you replace it by h thirds. And if you remember how we derived these formulas, you should see that if I replace h half by h third, everything is going to work out. It's just that you have to do it manually, because the, express, the formula is wrong. So, so that's kind of maybe nice. And if, you, if you feel that Richardson is messy, you might want to have a look at that. And um, another final, just mentioning a problem I was thinking of doing uh, that relates a little bit to what you guys did um, is for one. 28, where you ask to derive an expression for the third derivative of f. And I don't know if you guys know quite how to do that, but um, if you, uh, you know, it's a little out of top, but it would have been a nice exercise. When I derived the second derivative, you might remember that I did a little different from the book. I wrote down a bunch of Taylor, and I solved for the second derivative. And that led to the idea that the second derivative at some point of x0 is f of x0 plus h minus 2 of f of x0 plus of x, x0 minus h. Remember this formula? So this is a very important formula that is, of course, in the slides. And I derived it by writing up a bunch of Taylors and just solving for the second derivative. If you like that technique and you want to play with it more, this exercise asks you to do exactly the same thing for the third derivative. And it pops out there. So that was what I was planning to show. Um, Apart from that, I didn't think about too many other things. Any, any, it's not very interactive. More questions. <laughs> too much material? Too easy? Too hard? Well, I have office hours. Uh, now I, is it now mostly for my 10B? But they had an exam last week. I'm not sure they're going to be so much. So you can come now if you want to. But tomorrow afternoon is a great time, too. Question? How much MATLAB on the exam? Yeah, you, you're supposed to know it to the level of programming assignments. I reserve the right to ask MATLAB questions. Uh, <laughs> so not super fancy MATLAB, just understanding the language. <laughs>